Hello everyone, my name is Greg Boyer and I am the Marketing Manager for Hosokawa Micron Powder Systems. We'd like to thank you for joining us today for our webinar on mixing and blending technologies. I'd like to point out this time that if you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them using the Q&A panel in the lower corner of your screen. At the end of the presentation, we will try to accommodate as many questions as possible. Hosokawa is a global leader in powder processing equipment and systems with over 1,500 employees worldwide, production facilities in five countries, and 12 technical centers with state-of-the-art research facilities. We encourage customers to visit our facilities where we can partner with them to develop new materials and processes on more than 30 different pilot and production lines for size reduction, classification, mixing, drying, and many other technologies. Hosokawa Micron Powder Systems was founded in 1923 under the name Pulverizing Machinery and is responsible for Hosokawa's business in North America serving the food, pharmaceutical, chemical, and mineral industries. We have both chemical and pharmaceutical technical centers and contract manufacturing facilities. At this time, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Frank Bonero, Food and Pharmaceutical Applications Manager for Hosokawa. Frank has worked for Hosokawa for over 22 years, and is considered our in-house expert on mixing and blending technologies. Frank? Thank you, Greg, and welcome listening audience to our basics of batch mixing and blending presentation. During this presentation, we will address the batch mixing and blending of powders, concentrating on the different mechanisms of mixing and the equipment that provides those mechanisms. I'd like to begin with the following, some powder mixing basics. By definition, a powder is a large number of very fine particles of a dry solid in air. In the simplest sense, powder mixing is blending of just two powders, powder A with powder B, each with similar properties and in similar proportions. But as we know, in real life applications, this is seldom true. This is why powder mixing is sometimes not as simple as it seems. Mixing may also involve the second step in which a measured amount of a liquid is added to the mixture and sometimes an excess liquid may need, also need to be removed through drying using vacuum or heat. Sometimes mixing involves either coating or embedding a smaller solid particle A onto a larger particle B. Obviously, the mixing mechanisms involved here is quite different from just plain mixing. Always careful consideration should be given to mixing ratios between A and B, as well as the temperature and duration of mixing time. Mixing intensities, based upon characteristics of the powders and the end results desired, the mixing intensity may be high, medium, or low, and each involves a different type of mixer. A low-intensity mixer would tend to be slow, with tip speeds in the range of one meter per second, whereas a high-intensity mixer would have tip speeds in the range of 25 meters per second or more. The three basic types of mixing mechanisms are diffusive, convective, and shear. The V-cone mixer shown at the left is an example of diffusive mixing. The conical mixer in the middle employs convective mixing, whereas the high shear mixer employs a much more active and intensive mixing action. How do we select the right mixer? When selecting the right mixer, the following points are to be considered. What type of raw materials are we dealing with? This would be dry powders from granular to fine particulate sizes and cakes of varying consistencies. The relationship of energy versus mixing. Here we would address the required energy input just to move the materials within the vessel as well as the size of the batch. In addition, what intensity requirements are there to mix the materials in order to overcome the inherent bonding of the materials? Segregation phenomenon addresses what is required to maintain a homogeneous mix within the mixer as well as during the discharge of the material. This can be influenced by size and shape differences between the materials. And finally, the need to consider impact mixing versus shear mixing. 
Some characteristics of the material that affect the mixing, they would include the particle size distribution of the particles. This refers to the sizes of the particles from the coarse to the fine particulate. In addition, where along the particle size distribution curve do these particles lie and on what percentages? The particle morphology, which refers to the particle shape. We also need to consider surface roughness. The surface texture of how smooth or how rough will also affect mixing. Is the material cohesive? If so, how much energy is required to break the bonds and achieve the mix? Density is, is very important in determining the effect of mixing. The bulk density of the material or materials will influence the mixture. A low bulk density material will tend to float or swim on the surface of the, of the denser material. In addition, density is crucial in determining the required horsepower necessary to transport the material within the mixer. Additionally, we need to look at static charge, moisture content, and friability of the material. Some criteria that we need to look at when selecting the mixers would include the cycle time and capacity. Questions such as how long does it take to fill, mix, and discharge the mixer? These factors would determine the batch size of the mixer. The mixing accuracy. Based upon the sampling techniques, as well as the analysis of the sample, one would determine how mixed is the mixture. Specific mixing techniques, as well as duration of the mixing time, would influence the mixing accuracy. We also need to consider cleaning. How easily cleaned is the mixer? What features are required to access the mixer internals so that surfaces can be cleaned, and is CIP or cleaning in place possible? The filling and discharging of the material. Questions such as how is the mixer filled? Is it by unloading of individual bags, or is it their direct connect from hoppers above, or even if there's pneumatic conveying used to bring the materials into the mixer? And then how is the mixer discharged? Is this done over time, or is all the material emptied at, at once? And does the mixer allow for complete and total discharge with minimal product retention? Temperature is also another issue to consider. What are the limits of the mixing equipment with regard to seals, gaskets, lubricants, and the relationship to the temperature limits? This would be both in high and low temperature applications. The design construction primarily refers to the material construction of the product contact surfaces. This could be mild steel, 304 or 316 stainless steel, or exotic metals such as Hastelloy. If there's any residue that's left behind between batches, and as mentioned previously with regard to the discharging of material, how well and completely does the material in the mixer exit the mixer? Is this with no or minimal material left behind? And then we need to address safety requirements. Consideration with respect to explosion proof, where this design addresses the electrical components such as motors and switches, as well as emission rate during venting, and if there's a pressure design required, would this vessel be designed for atmospheric conditions or need to be withstand pressure shock resistant or PSR requirements? And then finally, we look at heating and cooling. What type of jacket is required? Would be a half pipe coil, a dimple jacket, or just a standard jacket around the vessel? When we look at the dilemma facing engineers, the very first step in the mixing process is to know your powders. Whether they are free flowing or not, will they mix easily? And if so, will they stay mixed? And will they, or will they segregate easily as well? How well they tolerate high temperatures or high shear? The answers to many of these can be reasonably obtained by running an analysis on a powder tester which measures seven individual characteristics of a powder to give you what is known as a flow behavior. Additionally, particle size, shape, and density will also provide indication of what challenges exist. Established mixer manufacturers can usually run these analysis for you in their lab. It's important to remember and partner and work with a manufacturer that not only produces the mixing equipment, 
but also has the test facility and the know-how to assist you before, during, and after testing. We also need to look at when is a mixture mixed. Establishing a mixture criteria to know when your mixture is mixed can be harder than you think. If the two powders are distinct in color, like black and white, then an intermediate shade can be used to determine the mixing endpoint. Some manufacturers offer optical analyzers on their mixers, and once it is calibrated to your powder, the process can be automated. However, not all mixing applications have visual distinctions, and chemical analysis or observing samples under the microscope might be required. Once you have your data, you need to decide what mixer to use. Now keep in mind that there are literally hundreds of different types of mixers, and unless you choose with care, a costly mistake could be made. So generally, you would need to decide whether continuous or batch mixing is required and make a determination as to what mixing mechanism to use, how to sample, where to sample, and how many samples to take, and then eventually how to analyze the sample. Different types of powder mixing, when we look at free-flowing, we have free-flowing mixture and non-segregative. This would include particles, obviously, with similar size and similar density. We also look at free-flowing mixture that has segregation possibilities, which would include ingredients with different particle size distribution and different densities. And then we look at cohesive powders. These would be powders that tend to stick or stay together, such as agglomerates. And then also the issues that are powders that are in a range between 70 to 100 microns. We start first looking at a free-flowing powder, and here we look at the distribution showed here that the particles will be uh, mixed randomly, and these powders would generally have little or no inter-particle forces, and individual par particles are usually large and dry. As a rule of thumb, such powders tend to mix easily, but the downside is that they also tend to segregate easily after mixing process is complete. And as such, for free-flowing powders, it's best to complete the mixing step and then proceed immediately to the next step, whatever that step may be. Segregation risks are apparent when you've got free-flowing powders. And in the four examples here in the upper left, percolation is where the random flow due to the particle size difference, where the smaller particles will fill the voids between the larger particles. To the right, we have vibration where now we're adding a mechanical influence which would result in a similar outcome. We also have to look at transportation of the material once mixed, and that's in case to the left where it's a horizontal flow and the case to the right with the vertical flow, each with material dropping out to particle size characteristics. Now we move to the cohesive powder. Here we show that we've got somewhat of a matrix of the powders, and we need to break those bonds and then mix those between the two components. And generally, cohesive powders tend to have a higher interparticulate force. These forces may be anything from physical bonding to moisture bonding to electrostatic forces to van der Waals forces, but could generally be classified as adhesive or attractive or repulsive in nature. It is harder to achieve good mixing with powders that are cohesive, but once the mixing has been completed, the mixture stays mixed and does not segregate easily. Generally, cohesive powders need higher energy input to achieve the mix. Here we have an application chart showing types of batch mixing. And the batch mixing is basically a time sequence of three steps, namely component weighing followed by blending, and then discharging. Which batch mixture can easily be used is usually narrowed down based upon two main powder characteristics as shown in the X and Y axis, which is flow characteristic versus material strength. As you can see, some mixers, such as the silo mixer, work well only in certain types of application, whereas others, such as the conical mixer or the ribbon blender, have a much wider range of application. As such, applications range and process flexibility determines to some extent the type of mixer you choose. 
Here we show basic of batch mixers of either tumble or bin blenders. These are a less costly, low intensity mix for a very good general mix capability. The issues though with mixers of this type is that segregation uh, as you discharge would be an issue, as well difficulty in handling materials that have agglomerates present. Other issues would be when filling and discharging can be cumbersome as you need to break piping to introduce the material and, and discharge the material. The conical mixer, which provides low intensity mixer, has a number of characteristics. First seen by the shape being a conical cone or shape type Vic mixer. Inside the mixer, there's three mixing actions taking place, giving a gentle, low intensity mix. Another example is low power consumption. Relatively speaking, low connected horsepower required for a given volume as compared to other types of mixers. For example, a 2,000 liter mixer would have a seven and a half horsepower screw motor and a three quarter horsepower orbit arm motor. Other mixers of similar volumes would require horsepower in the neighborhood of 25 to say 30 horsepower. The mixer also provides a high mixing accuracy since the entire batch is in movement at all times. There's minimum heat generation, which is due to the relatively low rotational speeds of both the orbit arm and the mixing screw. Features such as self-emptying and no segregation to the material as it discharges is due in part to the cone angle, which provides for complete discharge. There are no dead pockets, so there's nowhere within the vessel that the material can hide. The vessel is easy to clean by various methods, including special nozzles, lances, or clean-in-place clean spray balls. Liquid injection is also possible in order to coat or mix with the powder. We can also heat and cool the contents within the mixer by jacketing the vessel. And the mixer, vessel can also be used as a live hopper prior to the next step in the process. This keeps the material within a homogeneous state. As mentioned with the conical mixer, three mixing dynamics going on. This convective mixing inside the vessel is pretty common of this type of mixer mechanism. And when the particles move in three dimensions, vertically, radially, and along the periphery of the mixer. This mixing action combined with batch mixing mode results in a very thorough mixing of two or more powders or mixing of a liquid into the powder. Mixing can be slow and gentle, or increase with some faster and more intensive mixing. In a moment, we'll just show a short video. In this video, we'll see the internals of the material moving by the arm and screw. And then you can see down below a little bit more intensity as we lower the volume. And the conical mixer allows for a, a wide range of volume from completely filled to smaller percentages. Okay. Here we see the material being mixed within the vessel, the orbit arm rotating, the screw attached, and as we lower the volume, you can see a little bit more intensity of the mix. Next, we look at impact mixing. Impact mixing is when mixing blades hits or impacts the powder particles. The diagram above shows a batch type mixer in action. In this, the mixing blade has a sharp edge, quite like a kitchen blender. The powders being mixed are impacted by the blades turning at high speed. The edges and corners of the mixing chamber would tend to build up with some product, and so a scraper is necessary in order to remove this buildup. Shear mixing. This mixing action is a direction to tangential to the powder particles. As you'll notice from the slide, the energy input in a shear mixing action is very different from impact mixing. This action is desirable for certain end results for powder mixing. However, due to the nature of shear mixing, the ratio of useful, vol useful volume to the overall mixing volume is quite low. 
Next slide, we can see a flow pattern within that high shear mixer. And in some applications, two mechanisms are taking place at the same time, providing both impact and shear mixing. The impact is provided by the upper blades, while the shear is provided by the paddle. Applications for this would be mixing of a tri powder inhaler for pharmaceutical applications where we coat the active ingredient on an excipient, and the excipient acts as a carrier and carries that finer active ingredient on the surface. We look here at two powders mixed in three different ways. The mixing result obtained from the different mixing mechanisms is shown on this slide. The smaller red particles are cohesive powder, and upon being mixed with the larger yellow particles, tend to clump together under convective mixing action, which is described on the first slide. The second diagram shows the same two powders being mixed and using an impact mixer. And the third, we show the same two powders with a high-speed shear mixer, where the smaller particles either coat the larger particles or are embedded. So depending upon the desired end result, different mixing mechanisms and therefore different mixer types may be employed. <clears throat> On our application chart here, we show batch type mixing selection based upon two sets of machine parameters. That would be the mixing speed, which was typically measured either by the tip speed of the mixing screw or the ribbon blade or the paddle, and the intensity of the mixing action. Again, you will notice the lower speed mixers are usually convective or diffusive in their mixing mechanism, whereas the higher speed mixers are more often more intense and are able to impart a considerable amount of shear to the powder particles. Hand in hand with this goes mix, mixing batch sizes, with the low speed mixers being able to do much larger batches at a time than the higher speed mixers. Some of the batch mixings for the mid to low shear mixing applications. The conical mixer is one of the most common and versatile low speed mixers there is. These are available in capacities from less than one liter to well over 100,000 liters. The advantage of these mixers is that because only a small amount is being mixed at a time, that is the amount the screw can transport at any instant of time, the power consumption is quite low. This mixer also allows for liquid addition during mixing and also an optional intensifier in the center can speed up and improve mixing in certain application. The steep vertical walls and the bottom opening makes for a more complete discharge of the powder out of the mixer. However, these mixers may tend to get very tall very quickly and at such larger capacity sometimes present installation challenges where headroom is limited. Some additional features of the conical vessel we show here would be heating and cooling jackets of the vessel. We can introduce liquid coming through with a nozzle coming through the center of the drivetrain through the center of the orbit arm, and that liquid is introduced right at the apex of where the material is brought up from the side and allowed to cascade down to the bottom. So we're ensuring uh, most coverage of the liquid to that powder. We also have cantilever designs for full bottom discharge or a bottom locator of the mixing screw with a side discharge. In addition, there's a ball segment valve at the bottom right. There's a discharge valve for the mixer, which provides very good sealing. Other options as well as far as the lubricate or the, the drive of the orbit arm can be a lubricated design or a complete 100% lubrication-free belt drive system. We now move on to minimum, minimum and medium intensity mixers, where the advantages are fast mixing with a simple design drive for reduced wear and maintenance, and typically is a lower cost than traditional conical screw mixers. That's achieved by the single vertical ribbon screw, where we also can ask, add a secondary shaft ribbon flight to assist in the mix. It allows for very quick mixing and high mixing accuracy.
ribbon, brand, ribbon blenders. These are good general overall all-purpose mixers. The design is a horizontal design with the center shaft running through. Attached to that is the ribbon blades. Issues would arise here when we look for discharging, where we're discharging out the center of the vessel, and there will be some material, in most cases, left behind as a heel. In addition, their shaft seals would be in contact with material. So concerns need to be looked at, types of material being used, how abrasive, and what type of sealing do we are necessary. Plow mixers, another horizontal mixing type, we use for more viscous materials, such as cakes. Um, the using of the side choppers allows for the introduction of liquid, and it also requires a, a higher energy connected load to not only drive the shaft, but also drive the choppers. These two also have an issue with complete and total discharge of the material, since we're discharging from a either center or side port at the bottom of the vessel. Another mixer type is a silo mixer. This is a simple low cost mixer with large capacity mixing capabilities. It handles very heavy high bulk tension materials up to about 200 pounds a cubic foot in density. It's a simple low cost mixer with a vertical wall vessel a cantilevered single mixing design with low intensity mixing and gives you a fairly good, complete, homogeneous mix. An alternative to the straight conical mixer would be modified special design here. Where we change the angle of the cone from 65 degrees, from the 73 degrees to the 65 degrees. The mixer, uh, mixing screw itself is of conical shape, which means the screw flights at the top are a larger diameter than the screw flights at the bottom. Specific applications for this would be prior to an extrusion process. The mid shear mixers features here, you can see the dual arms. We have two orbit arms two mixing screws. These typically provide, a, again, a, general, a gentle mix, and the mixing times are much faster, and in relative terms, about eight times faster than your standard conical mixer. They do handle the materials gently, and because of the movement of the material within it in a more of an aerated form, they're very good for materials that are susceptible to breakage or damage such as spices and herbs. And just pause for us a minute. We're going to get the video showing the mixing action of this type of mixer. What you'll be seeing is the mixer, various different range of RPM of the mixing screws. We'll start off at a medium range, then we'll go to the lower range, and eventually you'll see a high RPM. This we got 50% filled with just full rotational speed. Now we're down at the lower rotational speed, and you can see there's not much. There is some action of mixing, but as we progress between the frequency and the motors to increase the rotation of the mixing screw, you'll see a lot more mixing action, and eventually in the end, a much more fluidized material. Here we're just part way through, and eventually you'll see at full RPM. And there the material is quite fluidized. That aeration also helps again in maintaining the integrity of the materials inside the mixer. And now we move to the batch mixing. This slide shows a high-speed batch mixer. It's intended to impart considerable shear energy on the product. It consists of a series of paddles at very close proximity to the sloping side walls and a row of impact blades at the top. The side walls are jacketed 
and hence can be either cooled or heated, depending upon the goal of the mixing process. This kind of high shear mixer is suitable for rounding and post blending operations in toner applications, and again is used in the pharmaceutical industry for coating excipients with active ingredients for inhalation drug delivery. And then again, pause, we're going to show another short video of this type of mixture. And this is what we'll see, and you'll notice as the material is being mixed, we're looking at a clear vessel, so we can see inside the mixer from the side, and the center shaft will be clearly seen during the entire mixing cycle. And here you see the intensity of the mix, material moving, and that center shaft is quite visible. That's because the material is being thrown out to the edges, being brought along the side walls, delivered to the top of the vessel, and then brought back down. In this slide, we show a range of batch mixing technologies, from the very low speed, low shear conical mixer to the high speed, high shear mixers for more demanding applications. As you'll see, the ones to the left have much smaller drives than the ones to the right, as well as the one to the left has been here and introduced for quite some time, as you can see, to address the mixing challenges that are now being posed, that we move to the improvements to the mid shear and then the high shear type mixer. So we look at the decision making points and what's right for me. So de de deciding the right mixer for your application is not easy. And no mixer manufacturer makes all the different types of mixers out there. And what is important here is your knowledge can help you make the difference. You need to know how flexible does your process need to be. Does it need to operate at 100% capacity or at 20%? Does it need to mix the same two powders with the same consistency during in a day in or day out? Will there be variations in the powder characteristics? Is the mixing process fixed or are additional steps such as liquid injection required from time to time? And is particle degradation an issue? Other questions is what does the capacity need to be? Is it 100 tons a day or is it just 100 kilograms? Is your capacity fixed for the foreseeable future or do you expect to grow over time? And many pharmaceutical applications require precise identification of batches for regulatory reasons, which limits the types of mixers that can be used. And in your application, how important is batch identification? When both Batch and continuous mixers may be equally suitable for your application. Your choice may depend upon what comes upstream or downstream of the mixer. If your overall process is geared more towards batch mixing, you may have to choose a batch mixer. And conversely, for a continuous line, a continuous mixer may be more suitable. It is critically important to understand line balancing so that each and every major component is optimized for the throughput and that there are no bottlenecks in the system. Another area to keep in mind is the cleanability of the mixture. mixture. In many pharmaceutical applications, this is a critical consideration, and mixer types that lend themselves to clean in place should be considered. Generally speaking, vertical surfaces are easier to keep clean than horizontal surfaces, and as such, mixers that are vertically oriented would be preferred over the ones that are horizontally oriented. And finally, the investment decisions will also need to be determined for your mixer of choice. It's best to have an idea of mixer costs in general in advance so there are no surprises. And finally, we look at mixing time calculations, and here's an example of what goes into or what are the key factors in determining the mixing time. We look at screw pitch, the diameter, and speed to determine what is the transport capacity for that design. And then we look at eventually the mixing time, which takes in consideration the volume, the transport capacity, and a homogeneous factor. All that results in the end at the bottom here of the mixing time. So in this example, we have a 1,000 liter mixer, and we can mix this 
in 9.13 minutes, so basically less than 10 minutes per complete mix. So I want to thank you for your attention and thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Frank. Um, at this point now, we're going to start the Q&A session. Uh, we noticed we see, received quite a few questions here, um, so I'm going to give Frank just a moment to kind of go through a few of these, and uh, we will try to accommodate as many as possible. I must uh, just mention at this time, though, if we are unable to answer your question live during the presentation, we will respond to you offline very soon. All right, Frank, do you want to okay. take the first question here? Yep. Okay, just a second here. We'll look at... Yeah. Yeah, the question as far as the rules of thumb regarding the particle size or whether a powder will be cohesive versus free-flowing, that is done when we look at the analysis and actually the data we, we get from that analysis. And using those seven measurements, we end up with an index, which is referred to as the CAR index. And based upon where that material shows up on the CAR index, will give you an indication if you're dealing with a free-flowing powder or a cohesive sticky powder. So we would look at the index from that analysis to determine where we where we are on the scale. Um, another question we have here um, looking at uh, mixers, mixing powders with a slight variation in their densities. Uh, this one asks for a continuous process. Um, that we can refer to uh, we have a, a webinar on our continuous mixing process, but in general, dealing with mixers with different densities and in the batch system, we would look at, like I mentioned before, about the swimming on top. There's a number of different ways of introducing the material that is the lighter, dense, the less dense material, and it can be staggered, staggered or stratified within within the mix. So we can introduce the dense material some of that, and then layer the lighter material and a little bit more dense material, and then layer it until we totally complete the, the filling of the mixer. And that way we aid the mixer and the mix in the ability to distribute those less dense materials with the, the more dense materials. Um, powder test or equipment do you use for powder characteristics? Here at Hasakawa, we manufacture our own powder tester, and with that, we'll determine the various uh, particle characteristics that are necessary to come up again with that CAR index number. Um, let's see. Let's go through here. Uh, we have a question as far as mixing. Um, again, we talked about dry powders, but if we're looking at pellets and in the applications where we're looking at pellets, they are going to be difficult to mix since they are seg sensitive to segregation. And also with the differences in densities may also ha affect the way that we mix. So there might be a best suggestion that we look at agglomerating or doing some larger particle agglomeration instead of straight mixing in order to come up with the end desired results. Um, there's another challenge, question we have, the challenge is overcome in mixing small amounts and large amounts of powder. And when we come across applications where we're mixing small amounts into uh, larger capacities, typically when these small components are down to a few tenths of a percent, we can look to mix those directly Again, in some cases, stratifying, or in other cases, we, we come up with a premix or a shot. So we can take those components and make them into a shot form, introduce that premix into the main mix, and then we can cascade that material over time within the blender. Okay. We have a question about material recommended for abrasive mix, mixes, and I assume we say material material construction. 
there are ways to uh, put in hardened surfacing on mixing components. Typically, we're looking at the mixing screw itself. Um, in some cases, made in a more a much more thicker design with some hard surf surface coating would be a way of uh, protecting the mixing components when mixing with an abrasive material. question is, how does the high shear mixer break the particle size of the powder during mixing? Does it break the particle size? There, there will be some size reduction taking place. It all depends upon the characteristics of the material, how friable it is. There's a lot of shear, a lot of force, and it depends, again, on your desired result. There's applications where using a high-intensity mixer that the end result is either the embedding or the coating, and in some cases coming up with much more different properties of the two components separate, and the desired result is to come up with different properties based upon the two components being mixed together. So that has to do with particle size and also the, the, the shape and the surface uh, morphology of, of the material. Um, the question is, what's the best way to clean the mixer after dry mixing without using liquids? There's ways to, say, not so much clean, but it's to minimize the, the material that's left behind, if any, on the surfaces, and that would be done pneumatically. It could be done by air. Uh, there are special nozzles that can be used to direct and pinpoint along the vessel surfaces uh, and that's done in applications. It's being done in applications, especially when the material has a high value, and you need to recover basically everything that's left behind. So without using liquids, it's done by, by air. All right, Frank, I see we're starting to run a little low here on time, so we're going to take one more question. Uh, as I mentioned before, though, everyone, if your question was not answered, uh, we will respond to you offline here. Question here is necessary to use filter bags in dry fine powder mixing process. In a um, batch mixing, you are when you're charging the vessel, uh, there will be some. You need to allow for the removal or the displacement of the of the gas or the air within the vessel. So there are times where there's a uh, venting taking place, and that can be done through nuisance venting, or in some cases placed on the mixer itself a bin vent. Um, but you definitely need to address, you don't need to have filter bags, you just need to address the, the volume that's displaced during the filling of the mixer. Okay, thank you, Frank. Um, this concludes the presentation today. Uh, we noticed we did have a lot of questions that we didn't get a chance to respond to, but as we mentioned, Frank or someone from our, our company here will respond to you offline. Uh, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. If you have any additional questions for the presenter, please feel free to take his information down and contact him offline. We'd also like to mention that the program has been recorded and will be posted to our website within the next 48 hours. If you've already registered for the program, you will receive an email notifying you once the recording is available, and you can feel free to review this at any time or share it with any friends or colleagues. Thank you very much. Have a great day.